Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocorth, host for episode 38. And thanks for taking the time to tune in today. Hope you enjoyed the one-year anniversary show. Thought it was a little bit of fun and I got a lot of good comments on it. So thanks a lot for everybody who responded to that. Let me get to a few stories that I'm covering for this episode. First story that came out during the week is something I guess we all kind of know already, especially those that are involved in the EV revolution and the movement, is that automakers really don't educate buyers or even really advertise in a lot of occasions with the exception of Tesla. Well, they don't advertise, but they do educate when you go into their stores. But that's all they do, of course, is sell EVs. Um, there's a British study that came out by a company called Encore Digital Media and a market research company called Savanta. And I've talked about some British um, surveys that have come out in the past that the public's awareness of electric vehicles is lacking. No surprise. It's kind of why I do what I do here to help educate people. With just four in 10 people able to name Tesla as an electric car manufacturer. Now, the, the second best known maker in the UK for electric vehicles is BMW which is, I guess, a bit surprising, but shouldn't be that surprising. Um, and it was named by a mere uh, 18% of the 2,000 respondents in this survey. While other brands, Nissan and Renault, kind of struggle to get about 15% recognition. So the research also asked people about some of the biggest barriers to adoption and charging, of course, the number one concern with uh, almost um, almost half saying that they were concerned about charging times and about 30 some odd percent harboring concerns about the lack of charging infrastructure. So if you watching what's going on in the UK and I've actually got a story coming up that's going to add a little bit more to this about charging infrastructures, they are actually building quite a lot. But even though over there. Uh, the general public, people that don't really follow the industry, are still concerned about this. Now, price is certainly a motivating factor for EV adoption, and, and they, people do alleviate to the fact that the pricing is much higher than you can get for a comparable internal combustion engine vehicle today. Um, however, they found the survey also found some misconceptions surrounding electric cars um, that can contribute, of course, to consumers' lack of really kind of getting excited about them. Some about over 53% were unaware that electric cars could be charged, albeit slowly, of course, but at home, uh, just using a conventional three pin household plug, whatever combination of household plugs you have in your jurisdiction. And you know, that's something I tell people a lot is when they ask about where can I charge my electric car? I said, well, where do you charge your cell phone today or your laptop computer or your tablet or all these other electronic devices? Well, I charge them at home. I next to my bed when I go to sleep or whatever. Well, it, you can put your charge your car the same way. Now, I wouldn't probably put it next to your bed and plug it in, but you could certainly charge it in, in any three prong household today. Uh, it might take you 24 to 28 hours or 30 hours to do, but it will do it. So that's one thing that people kind of find quite fascinating when you talk to them about that. And then two thirds of these survey people had no ideas that EVs could charge themselves slightly while decelerating, of course, regenerative or recuperating braking. So EV organizations and enthusiasts and so forth do what they do. They go out and talk to people. They go to shows. They organize uh, outings uh, in conjunction with other things to get the word out and to educate people. Um, again, you know, just something to think about when you're out talking to people that uh, the majority of people really have no idea. So we do need to be careful on how we portray things. And this is something that I talk a lot about in the forums and in websites that I go on and respond to comments. There's Again, you know, I mentioned this, I sound like a broken record, but so many people are just, you know, they go out there and they're very negative against other EV manufacturers and, you know, only supportive about one. And we really should be saying, look, each vehicle has their own pros and cons. Each manufacturer has their pros and cons. But what we should be doing is educating people about what they need and what could fit within their need. And also educating people about the how valid it is really to look at electrification to replace or displace an internal combustion vehicle. And that's the approach we should be taking. So hopefully people will understand that. And uh, again, take this ammunition out there when you're talking to people. Now, there's a new company that, uh, in fact, there's a lot of companies that are involved in the electrification game. Of course, we I talk a lot about battery manufacturers because that's really a huge industry that's continuing to develop. But there are also some of the other parts that go along with EVs and electrification. And one of those is the electric motors. There's a lot of research and development and technology advancements that are going into those technologies. And there's an article that came out about this company in Texas that's building a, a very efficient electric uh, motor. Um, that that are more efficient and more powerful than the ones today. And they this company claims that they can generate twice the torque, three times the power, and 10% more range for electric cars 
uh, in the same weight and space as a typical electric motor. So just by swapping out a typical motor today in, in a standard a battery electric vehicle platform that you would have this motor could add these type of specs to that vehicle that's pretty uh, outstanding now this company is called linear labs as i mentioned based in texas and um the the founder of this company the president calls this the linear flux sustainable electric turbine that's what's called for this motor and this motor it's a wound motor that uses four rotors where most rotors use one or two and i'm getting technical here so and the current can alter the magnetic field inside the cylindrical uh, stator to vary the ratio of torque to horsepower uh, it, in theory the more rotors you have interacting with the coils the more power you have so and that's why what they've come up with this idea um, the coils are surrounded on four sides with magnets, creating uh, what they call a torque tube. And they say now this motor, as they're continuing to develop, uh, can eliminate the need, need for a gearbox as well in electric cars. Now, most electric cars just have a forward and a reverse, and uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, but I think they can even bring that down to a more compact form factor. And the biggest ticket that I took away from this article is that they could save uh, an average of $8,000 to $10,000 off the price of a car. And these are U.S. numbers. That's a huge number when you look at a forty to fifty thousand dollar car to be able to save, you know, uh, a quarter to, to to a fifth of the price just by using these kind of motors. So I really hope that this tech that technology takes off. And uh, the company has twenty one patents and designs um, for and another twenty nine pending. Uh, we I don't expect to see these soon. Uh, they're supposed to be coming out and making their way into cars or available for electric ma manufacturers uh, into 2021. So uh, anybody can research this. It's called, again, Linear Motors. Go check them out. And it's, again, it's encouraging to see this development, the rapid development in EV technology. Now, I mentioned charging before about the UK. Well, there's this company that's just made a big splash called GridServe. You may have seen some things about that. They are, uh, they've got a billion pounds. Uh, this is a UK company uh, promoted by the government and supported by other uh, partners and providers that they're going to build uh, in excess of 100 sites. And these are basically, when I read this article, I thought of Tesla supercharging stations because these are going to be multifunction, multi-port, multi um plug stations uh, and they're going to design them like gas stations basically like petrol stations today and they're also going to be su supplying the power for these stations by clean low cost solar electric which is fantastic so what they want to do is they want to build these ultra fast uh, charging stations uh, for private and fleet vehicles to use and uh, they want construction to start on these uh, this year with the first of over 100 sites powered as i mentioned by both solar and then into batteries and the, the UK government and some other organizations are funding this. Now you're seeing some pictures that are going up while I'm, while I'm talking. This is a pretty, really neat looking places, futuristic kind of, uh, kind of take on this. Now each of these, what they call electric four courts, that's the patent, the name for these, will have dedicated zones for both private and fleet vehicles, such as taxis, buses, delivery vehicles, and such, and heavy good vehicles as well as offering new compelling customer focused charging experiences. So like fast charging and all this other stuff. Also, there'll be a coffee shop, fresh food, convenient supermarket, airport style lounges, the free Wi-Fi and all that kind of stuff. Also some knowledge centers within these, within these centers like education hubs so you can explore more about electric vehicles and the solutions. Again, within five years, they plan to have 100 or more than 100 of these four courts in use. Again, each supplied by solar and battery, solar power and electric battery storage. So because they're using battery storage, they can provide really rapid charging. Um, they can really go fast with an ultimate rate of 500 kilowatt, they're claiming here for cars and like commercial vehicles, which would be the world's fastest today, giving like a 10 minute charge experience. Now you're really talking about a game changer here when you're really looking at that, that walk going in and putting gas in your car, which is five to 10 minutes to do that. This is really starting to move the, the, the pendulum over a lot more. Competitive pricing, uh, they're going to have their own environment. The typical configuration of these stations will be 24 ultra-fast charging bays, again, with batteries to support maximum power requirements for all chargers being, being uh, drawn upon at the same time, which is, again, similar to what Tesla does in being able to offer high power to a multitude of vehicles. Great to see. I really hope this thing takes off and keep your eye on GridServe. 
Just quickly going to get into some car manufacturer news. I talked a little bit about the Peugeot E208 a few shows ago. I think it was back in December or early January when I mentioned it briefly when some announcements came out. Well, there's a lot more new stuff that have come out. Um, so I'll just give you some rapid specs. Basically, that's going to rapid charge in, in 80% in 30 minutes. I have a range of up to 211 miles. That's WLTP. So it'll be a little bit less from an EPA range, which is okay for Europe especially in the areas where these these things sell. It's going to have a 50 kilowatt hour battery pack, uh, guaranteed for eight years, 100,000 miles, 160,000 kilometer warranty, up to 70% of its charging. It'll be pro provisioned with 136 horsepower and torque of 260 newton meters. Somebody can figure that out in foot pounds and, and figure out what that is. Again, I mentioned a capacity of 211 uh, miles in WLTP ratings, and it will uh, handle charging up to 100 kilowatt. So a nice, round, neat package. You're seeing pictures and stuff uh, and video of this. It's a really nice looking car. Again, great to have you know, this type of, of compact, class i wouldn't say subcompact it'd be a compact car pla class a hatchback very popular in europe very popular in canada too in a lot of countries nice looking car i think it looks really cool and glad to see peugeot ramping up with uh, with their offerings as well into the ev marketplace I believe I talked about Ford on the last show, so just a couple of announcements that came out. Now, I'm a little bit disappointed that they're not full electric announcements, but hey, we'll take what we can get from Ford these days. So, as you guys know, uh, guys and gals know, I don't follow plug-in hybrid electric vehicles that closely, but this is what Ford's come out with. They've announced two announcements, both with 2020 model year uh, models, uh, versions of one of them being the Ford Explorer, which is their larger SUV vehicle here in North America, very popular. Well, they're shipping it off to Europe, and it's going to be available in a plug-in hybrid um, uh, model trim with up to i believe it is 25 miles of electric range they announced this at an event recently in amsterdam and it's going to be shipped to europe uh, it's going to have electric motor to add about another 100 horsepower to the gasoline engine of 75 kilowatts uh, it's got a 13.1 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack which is pretty good for european standards it'll be a three row suv so think of rivian and their big suv that's three rows as well well even the model x has three rows and the model y has three rows when it comes out even though it's small uh, but it'll be able to travel up to 25 miles or 40 kilometers with pure uh, electric energy and that's kind of why I, I i don't mind plug-in hybrids to a point because they are a stepping stone to full electricity where you can get some sort of all electric battery only range out of them um, these are going to come on to the european continent sometime next year with a couple of trim levels and no actual you know more, no more dates as far as exactly when this is landing but Again, it's nice to see Ford doing something. Now, they've also, in the same uh, articles uh, that I'm uh, mentioning, have come out with a Ford Escape version with a plug-in hybrid option for the year 2020. Ford Escape is their smaller compact SUV format. Again, another very popular vehicle here in North America. I see these things all over the place. They're, they're, they're a standard just like Honda Civics are over here. Um, they, there's not much details on the plug-in hybrid version of the Escape other than uh, that the total output from the hybrid, the plug-in hybrid powertrain will be somewhere in the excess of 210 horsepower or 156 kilowatts, uh, giving you uh, what they say is best-in-class range of at least 30 miles on battery only or 48 kilometers. Um, they do anticipate timing for the Escape to go on sale in the fall of 2019, but the plug-in hybrid, so this, this new version, will arrive in the spring of 2020. There's that magical year again where all kinds of stuff's happening. So, it'll get, I'm a little disappointed that we're not seeing a lot more all-electric electrification from Ford, but hey, we'll take some plug-in hybrids as a good start. Quick announcement, uh, we've seen a lot of collaboration in the car markets, the, especially concerning electrification. Uh, I mean, Tesla's opened patent. They were one of the first to do that years ago, open up some of their secret sauce to what they do to, to spur on uh, the electrification in the consumer transportation marketplace. And we, we know a lot of joint ventures. It's pretty common for auto manufacturers to do that. Well, here's an article about PSA Group and FCA, which are considering a joint platform development, uh, which will include heavily electrified vehicles. Now the PSA Group and Fiat Chrysler Motors or uh, FCA are in early talks about a limited cooperation to, to 
build what they call a new joint super platform. I don't know. I don't think it's going to have a triangular uh, blue and red uh, shape with an S on it, but they're calling it their super platform. Obviously, they recognize the need for their market shifting towards electrification, and they want to capture on that. So they are going to look at investing um, in that as well as autonomous driving technologies. And if you're, if you're not familiar with PSA, they recently expanded their company to include both the Opel and the Vauxhall lines, while of course Fiat acquired Chrysler some time ago. Um, they also actually uh, cooperate today on light duty vans in Europe. So that's a pretty big market for them, that, that more compact delivery sort of stuff, very huge markets in Europe. So again, we're seeing more of this um, manufacturer collaboration. We know Nissan, uh, Nissan, Mitsubishi, a lot Renault Alliance, all this kind of stuff. So it's definitely happening. Again, this you know the tsunamis come and uh, the wave is there and we're riding that now as it as it gets bigger and bigger uh, as the adoption scales up. So it's good to see more companies um, really take some actions. Finally, in my automotive segment today, uh, here's a company I haven't talked a lot about because I thought these guys were going toast as well. But Lucid Motors, um, they they're still there kicking and screaming. Looks like they're going to be around because they just got a whole whack of money from a Saudi fund. Um, they announced a billion dollar deal. That's one with a B, a billion dollar deal with a Saudi Arabian public investment fund. And that's been confirmed uh, that that deal has gone through. The investment's complete and it brings a lot more cash to Lucid Motors so that they can move forward with uh, their development and bringing their Lucid Air production vehicle, uh, EV, all EV uh, vehicle to production next year. And now they got the money to do that. So uh, Lucid is a private company, so they don't have to disclose any terms of the deal. But needless to say that we it's anticipated that the, that the Saudi fund is thought to have acquired a majority stake in Lucid to be able to give them that money. So they probably have like 50.1% or something like that. Uh, by the way, this is the same Saudi investment fund that also owns a 5% stake in Tesla. So they're certainly investing their money hopefully wisely at least they're thinking of that uh, if you're not familiar the lucid air is an elect electric luxury sedan to compete with the likes of tesla and other luxury sedans starting with a 240 mile range this is a u.s mile range and 400 horsepower you can do the conversions to metric um, it would start at about sixty thousand dollars u.s and the higher end versions will have a whopping 1,000 horsepower with 400 miles of range now, if that doesn't break your neck and jolt you forward, nothing will. A thousand horsepower, I'll tell you that. That should give the uh, the Tesla Roadster maybe a bit of a run for its money. That would be an interesting thing to see. Uh, with all kinds of other stuff cranked into this thing, uh, they've actually done some, some testing uh, with... Uh, the high-end Lucid Air, and they've actually clocked it at 217 miles an hour at some research center in Ohio. Not that you're going to do that on the highways, but on the Autobahn, you could. The company also announced a deal to provide air buyers with access to Electrify America's growing network of fast chargers. Uh, they say to eventually rival Tesla supercharger network. I'm a little doubtful on that because Tesla's got a pretty substantial lead, but hey, I'm all for Electrify America adding more, more superchargers and more fast charging networks. I don't have any more specs in the Lucid Air, but it's been around for a while, so you can go on the and Google that and get all kinds of specs. But hey, they're still around. And as I've been saying uh, almost every show, as I say all the time, hey, the more choice, the better. We like to see more competition spur up and uh, bring electrical electric vehicles to market. All right, just quickly, I got a couple of emails for my mailbag segment. Hey, it's nice to have some uh, some mail to talk about on this show. First one is from a gentleman in BC. I won't mention his name because he's been really uh, effectively communicating with me about his journey to acquiring a Nero EV, which I have not seen yet on the roads here in, in Ontario anyway. And I believe that he may be getting uh, one of the first ones in Canada. So we'll have to wait and see. But um, anyway, he's been telling me about his journey and he told me about some of the price points that it looks like that these things um, are going to be out there from a pricing. They're tentatively set at 53,800 Canadian plus your destination paint and all those other charges that uh, the dealer slap on you for that. Um, so it's certainly not a cheap vehicle. Uh, I'll be excited to see uh, how that actually works from the pricing unless they do any wheeling and dealing at the end. But the point of this is that uh, should be taking delivery of this within the next few weeks. Uh, I would say within the next two to four weeks. So that's good to start seeing the the Nero EV land on Canadian shores. And if anybody in Canada has already got one or has some ETAs on their orders, I'd love to hear from you. Please let me know.
And a second email is from a friend of mine called Serge uh, in Quebec. Uh, uh, hello, Serge. Thanks for communicating with me. He's been really good. Um, he sent me some information about his journey to electrification, which included a Model 3 adoption last year. He picked up uh, a long range version when they came out. And he just sent me a little bit of information as far as some things that I should inform people if you don't already know that, because I don't, I don't typically do a lot of Tesla updates on this show because there's so much other stuff to cover. But I found this pretty interesting. So he says that the new software version for the Model 3s, I take it this is going to be for the S and the X as well, which is 2019.8.4, gives uh, Tesla owners uh, the dash cam to record during traveling to see the road on three of the cameras. So you actually can, can record from the front and the two cameras one on each side of the vehicle to give you a forward facing view there which is pretty cool uh that's uh, nobody else is offering that so you got to love tesla for that and also they you've read about their sentry mode which i'm seeing some videos now that it's actually catching people doing naughty things to their cars not very nice so I'm, it's cool to see the sentry mode going but you got to remember he was serge was telling me that it uses about three percent of battery charge a day if you when you leave this thing on so if you're going to park it for a couple a week or so a couple of weeks you've got to factor that into what the state of charge may be when you get back now his model 3 is the long range one with the big big hyping battery which is the best range that you can get right now in a vehicle so he shouldn't shouldn't have too many issues but just something to take thanks serge for sending me the email and keeping me updated on what's going on with yourself i appreciate it and as always if you've got an email to send me please do um, and i'll get the contact information coming up and that's reached the end of the show as I look around for my notes here of this episode, episode 38 of the EV Revolution Show. Thanks very much for tuning in. Remember, I'm here, folks, to educating minds one tailpipe at a time. That's kind of what I'm trying to do here. And uh, I'll remind you about the fully charged stuff coming up. Uh, if you I'll flash this here, if you haven't got tickets, please uh, look into that. Check into the websites. And as always, thank you for everybody's um, uh, uh, participation in viewing and in comments. Again, the uh, overflown with a lot of congratulations on the one year show that I just put up. I appreciate all that. And uh, for my Patreon followers, thank you. Again, I'm hum- always humbled by that and those that reach out to me and uh, and want to say hi and just tell me that they like what I'm doing. So I appreciate all that. And I think that's about it. So until the next show, please, everybody stay safe. And, uh, you know, we'll see you next time when I see you. Take care. Bye-bye.